All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kathy Bowles. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and also the Vice President for Research at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And I'm so proud today to have uh, three of the top uh, nurse informaticians in the, in, in the world here on our panel. Um, pays to have friends in high places. And I really appreciate them taking the time today to be with us. So I'm going to introduce um, all of them right now. And uh, uh, Suzanne's going to go first. And then we'll have questions after each of the speakers and then be able to have more discussion at the end. So our first speaker will be Suzanne Bakken, and she's the alumni professor of nursing and professor of biomedical informatics at Columbia University. She's a nurse scientist who completed her postdoc training in medical informatics at Stanford University. She conducts federally funded research at the intersection of informatics, data science, and health equity. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, she is president of the American College of Medical Informatics, and she is, uh, this year, is a, uh, in residence as the nurse scholar at the National Academy of Medicine. So we're really pleased to have Sue with us here today. The next speaker will be Dr. Westra, Bonnie Westra. She's an associate professor in, at the University of Minnesota, and she is the director of, for the Center for Nursing Informatics. She co-chairs the Architecture and Informatics Committee for University of Minnesota's CTSA grant and is responsible for creating usable research data from EHR flow sheets. So all of our nursing colleagues in the audience will be very happy to see that Bonnie's working hard with her team to get nursing uh, generated data represented in big data science. She co-chairs the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science Conference each year that is um, held at the University of Minnesota. Now our final speaker is Dawn Dowdy, and Dawn is a professor of nursing at Columbia University School of Nursing, and she has a joint appointment with me at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York uh, as a research scientist there. She is a nurse and a health services researcher by background and has spent her academic career carrying out research into how clinicians make decisions, developing and evaluating clinical decision support interventions, and more recently, evaluating uh, clinical decision support in, and more recently, evaluating technology and how it affects decision making. Excuse me. Uh, previously, Dawn was the professor of applied health research at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, where she led the decision-making research group. She was a Harkness Fellow in Health Policy and Practice at Kaiser Permanente, fell in love with America, and here she is. So we're <laughs> pleased to have all three of these esteemed colleagues here today, and I welcome Sue to the podium. Thanks. It's my great pleasure to be here. I want to give you a warning. Both Bonnie Westra and I were asked to repeat uh, talks that we've given at a previous con conference, and we had 90 minutes there. <laughs> so we're going to hit some highlights, and I'll point out where you can get some additional information. I'm happy to talk to people a little bit, uh, a, a little bit further. But one of the things that the National Institute of Nursing Research and others are thinking about is what is really the, the role of big data and symptom science? Because this is an area that has a lot of uh, interest from the nursing community and others, and it's clearly, uh, clearly important, important to patients. And um, I'd like to tie this in with my interest in um, health equity, and I won't uh, read the slides, but just point out to you that there are health disparities that relate to different aspects of symptom science, both thinking in terms of recognition, in terms of management, and in terms of outcomes. And a number of these, uh, on the basis of, of studies that look like, that, that, that use traditional sources of data, would appear to be uh, related to things such as uh, race or ethnicity. But we really end up uh, having the opportunity to think about symptom management differently. And this is a symptom management model that comes from 
the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing. And the basic idea is just showing you the relationship between symptom uh, perceptions, symptom management, and thinking about various types of symptom outcomes. And traditionally, when we thought about data sources for this, they have primarily focused on things that would be fairly traditional. This is data that you can get from uh, patient-reported outcomes, which are valid measures. You might gather data from other uh, clinical sources and lab tests, et cetera. But these days, as everyone knows, in the era of big, big data, we're getting additional uh, data sources. And so we think about what are the various types of omics that are available. And this was pointed out in several of the, the talks this morning. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and so thinking about what you might be able to get in terms of, um, in terms of information about SNPs or genome or uh, excuse me, proteome or other types of things that might be relevant to thinking about system symptoms. But also then uh, thinking about it from the perspective of the quantified self movement. And only a few years ago, I think uh, the notion of really gathering a lot of, of self-monitoring data was not as uh, not as typical. But with Fitbits and other types of things, we see a lot more people that are kind of doing the quantification of, of self, whether you're doing it for fitness uh, purposes, for monitoring, or in this instance, there's a lot of potential uh, devices such as Fitbits and um, actographs and that kind of thing when you think about it from the, from the perceptions of symptoms. Now to... Hit it uh, twice. Hit it twice. Yeah. Make that a little yeah. real. Um, so one of the... So I'm going to spend a few minutes just thinking a little bit about the promise of big data in this area of research and then some, spend some time thinking about some of the things we need to, to, need to, need to think about, and that would, be, um, that would be the peril. So the idea would be that we're able to join a variety of data sources that might help us to uh, tell a bit more of the stories, either in terms of um, symptom assessment, symptom management, or symptom outcomes. And I have a couple of examples of uh, studies up here. And in the first one, they were really looking at uh, uh, gene environment and symptom, gene environment symptom interactions in the area of depressive symptoms. And as you can see from the slide, there actually end up being differences for males and females, with one having environment make a difference in um, the reaction to the depressive symptoms and the other one having a genetic influence. In the second example, which is uh, an, an example uh, related to drug metabolism, it was thought that it was race potentially that would be the difference in um, how this drug was metabolized. But when they, it happened to be a particular allele that was more common in people who were African American. And so the point ends up being some of the things that we may be attributing to race are not really race. They must might be attributed to um, some type of genetic component that happens to be expressed more in a particular group. So I'm going to get a little more um, specific to talk about how I think about this from pers perspective of uh, some of my own research. And in my uh, research, I focus on um, Latinos who live in the Washington Heights Inwood part of New York City. And that's the skinny part of Manhattan. It's five zip codes. If you look out um, to the um, east, you can see Yankee Stadium. And anyway, it's a very vibrant immigrant community, uh, primarily people from the Dominican Republic. But there are high levels of health disparities, diabetes, cardiovascular risk, obesity, uh, those kinds of things. And for the last um, I guess it's been about six years now, we've been doing a project that we call WISER for short. It stands for the Washington Heights Inwood um, Informatics, uh, Informatics Infrastructure for Comparative Effectiveness Research. And I see one of the co-investigators, Chen Ma Wang, is here in the room as well. But anyway, the basic idea from behind this project was the brainchild uh, of Adam Wilcox was imagine if you did the, the Framingham study today, but instead of studying 
uh, a fairly well-to-do community in Massachusetts. You looked at an underserved uh, community, and you used informatics techniques rather than um, uh, rather than using only survey methods. And so the basic idea is let get, let's get data about the community from clinical, from different types of studies. And we also uh, decided to add a community-based survey and to be able to bring these things together. The original uh, idea was to primarily have it for research use. And so there are a number of tools developed that help researchers to uh, be able to use that data. But we also added uh, the box at uh, the top on um, your right, which says give it back to the community. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Because we wanted to make sure that not only researchers had access to the data, but the patients who generated the data had access to it for their own purposes. So when we think about, when we think about wiser, am I out of time already? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, when, we, when we think about WISER from the uh, perspective of what's data and what's big data, we, uh, within our project we have traditional electronic uh, clinical data as well as some survey data. In what we're thinking about now, how we would more fully contextualize our community and the things we would like to look at more in a precision medicine approach, we are in the process of adding up the things that are on the far right. And these things are organized according to something called the county, hang, county uh, ranks uh, framework. And these are things that help to predict um, health outcomes. But thinking about how can we add uh, data from apps, how can we add genomics, how can we add uh, some additional things that we didn't collect in our initial study. One of the things that can happen in research is we really initiated this project from the perspective of thinking about it for comparative effectiveness research, but in the end it actually laid a very nice uh, uh, foundation for precision medicine if you think about it broadly from the perspective of the way the NIH cohort is being thought about that you really want to take into account genes, lifestyle, behaviors as well as environment. And so we, in addition to survey data, we have clinical data. We have a, 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 one third of our sample so far has also provided um, specimens for DNA analysis. And virtually everyone agreed to data linkage and to future, future research content. So we're looking about what we might do more in that uh, regard. But I want to just, as exciting as it's as it is to have all that data and be able to bring it together to potentially work uh, with the community as well as researchers and to think how can we help reduce uh, health disparities. We do need to think carefully about what are some of the potential perils. So in terms of thinking about uh, uh, data resources, you need to be paying attention to whose data is actually in the big data resource that you're using um, for your study. Depending on the type of resource, uh, you could end up uh, having a very biased sample. And if you're particularly interested in advancing health equity, um, trying to do some of those things in a data source which might not uh, be very diverse and might not represent those who are at most risk for the particular condition, um, wouldn't actually yield you the scientific validity um, you wanted. Uh, we also have to think about who are the people who are accustomed to doing a lot of quantified self. They might be more available in those, those types of resources, and that may be a very different sample from many of the people that um, I work with. And so we really have to think from a, uh, from a policy perspective, is the uh, generation of big data and data science, can we use it to advance health equity, or is it going to actually hinder it and that you won't get the N of 1 treatments or some of the discoveries on uh, the, the diversity of the, of the U.S. population. Another concern that people have is where's the judgment, where's the clinical thinking? Data science involves bringing that expertise together with the computational method. You don't, theory doesn't go away, critical thinking doesn't go away. You just might generate different types of research questions with using uh, these approaches. But the thing that I want to uh, 
focus a little bit on is just giving you, uh, looking at some of the perils through uh, the typical type of framework that we use um, when we think of research and to specifically focus on uh, uh, three, uh, three ethical uh, principles. And first, thinking about a uh, person's autonomy. And so this is giving informed consent for use of the data. So there are a number of issues that can um, arise in this part. I only want to emphasize um, one thing. And uh, the, in the short presentation, you're not so much meant to look at the actual regression equation. But the point ends up being that when we looked at consent in our population, the, the variable that most predicted consent was health literacy. And so when we're trying to achieve um, uh, a broad inclusion of diverse populations in research and we're trying to advance uh, health equity, we really need to think about the consent process and making sure that we have consent processes that make it easier for people of various levels of health literacy to participate uh, in the study. We also need to think about this from the perspective of beneficence, and beneficence is who gets the risks and who gets the benefits. Uh, one of the things that we felt strongly was that our community members generated data. It shouldn't just be the researchers that get the benefit of that. We should also figure out how to uh, uh, give the benefit directly back to both uh, people who participated in our survey, but also to researchers in, in researchers, community-based organizations, et cetera. So we engaged, uh, we embarked upon a series of participatory uh, design sessions with community members. We did, I think, 22 focus groups, um, maybe 18 or so in Spanish and then a few in English, and worked with the community to design some results reporting. Uh, patient reported data. So this is just, um, I'll say ahead of time, our designs are freely available. Anyone interested in these, just ask and I'll send you everything. So this is just the design we um, work with on the community to create that shows somebody's tailored high blood pressure value along with their risk and then some additional information about uh, high blood pressure. We also wanted to be able to display um, health status compared to ideal across a bunch of different uh, variables. And so this is an example of one of the drawings for that. To, uh, to create these designs, which, are, um, which have values that are tailored to the individual community, members. We created a system which we call ENTICE, which stands for Electronic Tailored Infographics for um, Community um, Education, Engagement, and Empowerment. And so this is the system we use to produce those tailored infographics. And we put it into GitHub uh, so that we can uh, make it open source. We haven't quite released it yet. We're still um, fine-tuning it a bit, but once away, once again, um, that's open as well. And lastly, uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of justice, just uh, making sure that we pay careful attention to the recruitment of uh, of, of, of diverse populations into the particular um, into the particular uh, research studies. And so, uh, this is very fast. My conclusions. So a big data really offers a very um, uh, offers so much um, potential. I'm very excited about it, and I'm very excited about the potential to use it to uh, advance health equity. But in addition to thinking about the technical things and what we can possibly do by bringing all these uh, different types of data sources together, we also need to think about it from an LC framework that is ethical, legal, social. Um, um, and so a number of the people in the room I know from the, uh, are from the nursing informatics community. So as we do this kind of work, we need to think about what are the competencies related to um, data science and how they might differ a bit from the traditional nursing informatics uh, uh, competencies. And so what we argue, and there's a couple of public, one publication that Patty Brennan and I finished that was out in September that's called uh, 
nursing needs big data and big data needs nursing, we argue that nursing presents a, a particular holistic perspective that's very useful um, to, um, to data science and that um, we can also benefit from the methods that come from that, that particular area as well. And so I encourage you to uh, uh, look at this area. This was a very uh, short talk and I'm happy to answer any questions and also provide you with any of the resources, uh, access to any of the resources that I've discussed. So with that, do I have time for a question? Or did I mm -hmm. Does anyone have a question for me? I'd be happy to say more about any of the things that I've talked about. I have a question, Vaughn. Okay. So, um, you, a couple of times you mentioned about being concerned about missing data and data being missing in certain cohorts of your population. What, what, tell us some of the strategies you've done to capture that data when you find that that is happening. Well, I, it's a couple of different... So one is really thinking about the importance of that data for the question that you're trying to answer. answer. And then there would be particular methods as well um, that you might be able to use weighting strategies for some of the type of things if you have a, a lower, um, if, you, if, you, if your sample is not as represent, representative as you wanted it to be. With many things in, in data science, you're really going for the population, not the, not the sample though. And is some of your data collection in person that you're able oh, yeah. to go out uh, to the communities? Yeah. yeah. So all of our all of our data collection, uh, I'm sorry, all of our data collection in the community is face to face okay. with bilingual community health workers, and so they're trained and they're mm -hmm. culturally matched and, and those types of things to help uh, help facilitate that. And for some for the other data sources, obviously we use secondary resources. Mm -hmm. And so we can do comparisons to see how representative the community versus the clinical data is. And we've, we've done that. And we uh, our sample looks pretty similar to the, to the clinical sample, actually. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Steve. My name is Bob. Kevin Johnson, if you hear me. Um, I, at the risk of being very naive about the question, I'm just curious about the relationship between kind of the work that's been done to establish standard terminologies in the nursing space and the desire to merge the data that is both sort of nursing specific and all of the disciplines. Is there, is there a challenge there? Is there, is there a synergistic opportunity? Where is that? No, um, and uh, Bonnie may talk a bit more about this <laughs> as well. And um, I think it, it uh, so what I would say from, from my perspective is that a, uh, a lot of work has been done to establish a set of standardized nursing terminologies. Bonnie and I were on a committee together at the American Nurses Association that approved, approved those. And uh, I think it's very important that those that those standardized terminologies that represent uh, nursing knowledge uh, development uh, uh, have that process in place. What we both kind of argued with, argued for in different ways that everyone up here has experience in standardized nursing terminology is uh, really figuring out how they get integrated into um, the broader healthcare terminologies. And so I think the basic rule is if it's a, if it's a, if it's a constant, if, I do not believe it's easy, it's possible to tell what's sensitive to nursing if everyone can't use the same sets of terms, so I don't think you should, I believe that unique concepts should have their unique identifiers that might be uh, shared concepts which have different names, but we have to recognize the synonymy. But I think if a physical therapist wants to use something that actually comes from a nursing diagnosis terminology or somebody else wants to do it, I think that's what we, that's what we need to do because we shouldn't focus so much on the profession that generated the term, but we can learn a lot by figuring out who does what for what reason and how much of that dose is given. And for some things, it may make a difference who does it, in other instances, it may not. And if we each just stick to only allowing 
our own language, our standardized terminologies to be used by the members of our profession. We, we, we lose the ability to do that. Thank you. <laughs> so just to add to what um, Sue just said is, the University of Minnesota has been leading the Big Data Science Conference for the last three years to have a national action plan for shareable and comparable NERS data for Big Data Science. Um, the ONC actually had some guidelines about how to think about this, which is the e-clinical quality measures. If it's an assessment, you would use LOINC, and if it is a problem or an intervention, you'd use SNOMED CT. That's the very short version of it. And so we actually have been working with the American Nurses Association to say that all healthcare settings must implement a standardized nursing terminology, one of the ones that's been recognized by ANA. They have excellent knowledge models that go into those. But when it comes time to put data into a clinical data repository or to exchange data with a continuity of care record, that then the federal standards should be followed that all the terminologies need to be mapped to SNOMED and LOINC for data exchange and for comparative effectiveness research across healthcare settings. So, um, I would love to talk about that forever, but uh, that's not the purpose of my talk is today. So, <laughs> I, so one of the things that I did is I pulled out a piece from the National Institute of Nursing Research Boot Camp that we did um, this summer. And so I will talk about just one aspect of how, what do you actually do with the data. So we know from listening to the other presentations that there are just really uh, excellent examples of artificial intelligence and data mining and different methods of data analytics. Uh, what I want to do is demonstrate how that applies to big data in a community-based setting and how you can use that data for multiple purposes. So first I want to just talk about the importance of having a diverse research team talk about then how to think about using both traditional and cutting edge data analytic methods um, and apply that specifically to a national convenience sample um, that we've had for our research and then to, to really look at exact, specifically those methods. One of the things that's important not only to acknowledge the team members but in addition to acknowledging the team members is to demonstrate that we have biostatisticians, we have data miners, we have uh, students, we have faculty, we have uh, you, know, you know, people from all different walks working together on this and it truly takes a team to be able to do this. It's the combined uh, effect of cross-pollinating our language and our domain expertise that really leads to, I think, the better science. So I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that we did off a large data set. One of the points here is that once you have data and you clean the data, you should like get a whole bunch of mileage out of it. Because having doing secondary use of data for purposes of research really takes a long time to do the data preparation, to really get it cleaned up, to get it set up so that you can actually do something meaningful with that. So I had a, a data set that we put together. We had a study that was funded by the Wound Ostomy Continence Nursing Society. And the question they had is, it seems logical if you have a certified Wound Ostomy Continence nurse that of course you have better outcomes, but there's no proof. And without that proof, then agencies are like, why would I pay to have a certified nurse if I don't know that that certified nurse makes any difference at all? So what we did is we uh, looked at trying to say, if you have certified wound ostomy incontinence nurse, do you have better outcomes for wounds and incontinence and UTI? And we looked at that both from an organizational outcome perspective, like overall your patients and your outcome, if you have a certified uh, walk nurse. And we also looked at it at the individual patient letter. Uh, level. And then subsequently we reused part of that data to do some data mining looking at improvement in ambulation. So as you look at home care electronic health record data, um, I thought we were in Fat City when we got data. I mean we had something like 808 home care agencies that contributed data and it was 1.5 million different assessments for 888,000 patients, and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I can like really have a good time playing. Well, then when we started actually having to match an initial assessment with the discharge assessment, and uh, going through all the cleanup of that data, one of the things that you can see is we actually ended up not having that much data in comparison to where we started. We ended up with only data from 785 home care agencies 
and with about half a million patients um, in our data set. But I still was pretty happy half a million patients counts. Now, there's one way you could actually get OASIS data, which is what we used in home care, um, more easily than I did. But you can't get matching data to go with it to answer other questions. So if you go through the University of Minnesota ResDAC, you can actually get OASIS data from them. Uh, they're the distributor for Medicare. But then you can't match that data up to, we wanted to know which agencies had a certified nurse and which patients had a certified nurse as well, so we had to collect the data from the home care agencies. As we looked at that, one of the challenges is that there are multiple measures for outcomes, so we had to go through and determine what was the best way to measure outcomes for pressure ulcers, stasis ulcers, surgical wounds, urinary incontinence, urinary tract infections, and ball incontinence. So we had six different outcomes, but with our six different outcomes, we actually measured those in two different ways. One is, did the patient improve? And the second is, did they not get worse at least? And so when you look at that, you have different denominators when you try to say that. So they can only improve if they had a problem when they started, so you drop out everybody who didn't have a problem. And they only can stabilize, meaning they don't get worse, if they're not at the bottom of the scale. So we have different denominators as we're looking at these kind of outcomes. One of the questions that we asked is, what is the prevalence in agencies where they have a certified walk nurse and, or don't have a certified walk nurse? So you can see that there are some similarities um, in the kinds of prevalence that we're seeing. And you can see that there also are some similarities and now some dissimilarities in terms of incidence, meaning new episodes since the admission date. And it's specifically around the whole area about if you take a look at it, uh, agencies that did not have a walk nurse had a much higher incidence of urinary incontinence than what we were seeing in those with walk nurses. The short story of two years of analysis is that when we looked at the effect of walk nurses, or our wound ostomy incontinence nurses, what you can see is that overall, on an agency level outcome, in other words, all of the patients in the agency, whether or not they specifically had a certified nurse, had improvements in their outcomes. So anything that's in the positive number here, with the exception of stasis ulcers. And the reason that all patients in an agency benefit is because certified nurses don't just take care of individual patients. They affect policies, they affect equipment, they affect education, so they have a larger organizational impact as well. When we worked with stasis ulcers, we were like, why, oh why, oh why? Is this not working no matter what we try to do? And then we looked at the question, and Donna Bliss, who's a specialist in this area, said, well, look at the question. You've mixed um, venous and, and arterial stasis ulcers together, and it's like they're not going to be reacting in the same way, it's a bad question. And we're like, oh. So the other thing too is that as we looked at individual patient outcomes, and this is very interesting, and think about your own organization, how do you know when a specialist, that is a nurse specialist, is actually seeing a patient? So in home care, when a nurse makes a visit in home care, a physical therapist, the visit counts under their name. When a second person goes in, they don't write a note. Not in the visit notes, so there is no visit record like we would see. So we got very creative about all the different ways you could figure out which patients actually had a certified nurse. And it was one of the biggest challenges in our study to figure that out um, as we went forward. And there is no standard about how they're tracking specialist visits, not like there would be if you have physician special, you know, special visits, because you don't get paid for them. So they document in different ways. One of the things that you can see here, though, is that we are not actually able to do logistic regression, which we had done previously, but we actually had to do propensity scores and say, what's the likelihood that somebody's actually going to improve, meaning a downward slant, from admission to discharge in terms of their outcomes? And what we saw is that home care nurses made a difference and certified nurses made a difference. However, certified nurses always saw the sicker, patients than what the home care nurses did. And so both were effective in what they were doing in almost all of the outcomes that we took a look at. So kind of the bottom line of this is that having a very large data set allowed us to be able to demonstrate on a national basis 
that having a certified wound ostomy continence nurse does make addition, make it, make, is valuable in both in home care, whether or not they see patients, because there's also an overall agency effect. Well, once you've got data, then you should actually like use it. And so we were looking at this data, and I have a data mining group I work with, with computer science students and faculty, um, as well as different nurses, uh, students that have been working with us over time. And so one of the questions that we wanted to know is that, um, is it possible to take a look at another outcome? Well, we had IRB approval to use some of the data, but not all of the data from the different data sources where we got it. So our sample size dropped down uh, about half of what it had been. As we took a look at this, one of the things that we found is that we wanted to look at improvement in mobility. And what difference do we see in terms of changes in mobility uh, for patients? Now, when CMS posts improvement in mobility, on their website, it's a risk adjusted. The biggest factor that makes a difference in terms of risk adjustment for improvement in mobility is what their status was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So kind of like the worse off they are, the more likely they are to improve. Well, that's true to a degree we found out. And so one of the questions that we wanted to understand is that if you have uh, different levels of mobility on admission, are the predictors of improvement the same? or are the predictors of improvement different? So as we looked at this, what you can see is this is the question that gets asked, is are they completely independent? Uh, do they need to use a device? Um, do they require supervision or use of a device at all times? Um, are they in chair fast and unable to, uh, but the, unable to ambulate, but they can get themselves around in a wheelchair? Are they chair fast, but they're unable to be able to ambulate um, independently, or are they bed fast? Well, I can tell you right now, there's no predictors that we found that were statistically significant if you're bed fast for improving an ambulation. I'm like, thank God. I would worry a whole lot if that was uh, the case as we looked at this. So as we looked at the different groups, there were differing numbers of people in the different groups for both improvement and again we looked at um, no improvement associated with this. And then we used a data mining approach. And so data mining, there are steps in the process that are similar to traditional statistical analysis, which is you first have to select your patients. Uh, you have to pre-process or kind of clean up your data. There are transformations of data that are required, but then data mining is a different uh, analytic method that you would use rather than like logistic regression, for instance. And then you always have to interpret the results because you can get some really great results that have no meaning <laughs> when you get all done. So you have to make sure that your domain experts are always involved. So as we looked at this, we ended up with only a quarter of a million patients instead of half a million patients only because of needing to get IRB approval for the rest. Um, and we had data only from 581 home care agencies, but that was still pretty good. We also took a look at, is if you look at uh, where patients are at, we found that as you take a look at these patients, that those who, um, sorry, I put my glasses on here. It's a really small on my screen, and I don't have a uh, tripod. So anyway, you can see that there's a difference of who's likely to improve and who's not likely to improve. And the second one was the most interesting to us because the the second one is patients were most likely not to improve if they had a score of two on admission versus a score of one or other scores. So they weren't the same in terms of their rates of improvement. So we used uh, data mining uh, techniques. What we wanted to do is look at are there certain characteristics of patients that would lead to more likely to improve versus not improve, and we only pulled out those patients who had a two at the beginning of uh, their uh, their admission. We also, by the way, have compared the other groups, and this was just published in um, Nursing Research uh, in January. And what we found is that the predictors uh, are somewhat the same in some of the groups, and some of them are like really different. So you can't assume that your level at admission, actually that if you want to improve, is the same across it. So we did a, a heat map, first of all, looking to see are there different um, types of groupings that show up and what we found is that as we looked at every variable, which is 98 vari 99 variables against every other variable on the heat map, is that there were some questions in the bottom left hand corner that looked at paid help, 
There were some that looked at, uh, they had no ADL problems. There were some that we were pulling out that were about behavioral health. Um, some that, you know, looked at, they had needed some help with finance. And so this heat map really helped us begin to see that there are some different clusters, even with this, this level two, meaning they needed a device or assistance at all times and admission, that there's different clusters of characteristics showing up. So we did cluster analysis for patients in group two, and what you can see here is that the red dots mean that these are patients that are more likely to improve, and the characteristics of those patients who are more likely to improve. And then we had to name them. So I was really glad I had done a qualitative dissertation because naming patterns is, you know, really an art as you go through this. It's like, what does this represent? Well, we actually had somebody one, in one of our versions that had problems with phone and then cognitive deficits. And I'm like, what does the phone have to do with the cognitive deficit? Well, I finally found a study that said phone is not about dexterity. Phone is about you actually can think through how to use a phone dial and you can interact with the phone and know there's a person on the other end. Never thought about using a phone as a cognitive deficit. It was really pretty interesting. But anyway, um, what you can see here is there's the larger the dot that really kind of the more likely that this characteristic is going to show up in this group. And so we had some patients who are more likely to improve if they were healthier physiologically and, psych and psychosocially. Um, if you look at another group on the bottom, that older adults with no problems in daily activities, specifically one group is around dressing and grooming, but another group was really around um, toileting, meaning bowel incontinence, confusion, and feeding. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a group that's really about household management. So when you see a zero, a zero means they did not have a problem with it. And the next slide, I'll show you some of the same questions, but they have a one, meaning that they did have a problem with those specific characteristics. So you can see here that there are different groups, and what that means is there are also different strategies you have to think about as you tailor your interventions to how do you think about this group of patients with these characteristics and how you might support them. We also wanted to understand who is not likely to improve in ambulation. And what you can see is there's one group at the top that took us forever to name. It's like, what name this to and what do you call this? Well, we finally looked at the literature and decided that this really represents frail elderly. They had a lot of problems with the one at the end of the name in many different features, needing, you know, they were the Medicare patients, they had psychosocial problems, they had dressing problems, they had IADL problems. So these we named as our frail elderly who are going to have more difficulty improving in ambulation. On the right-hand side, toileting and transferring was another group. Another group is paid help. So if we look at this, who is not likely to improve? Well, think about when you move into assisted living, you know, you're probably in a different group than those people who are able to be at home. And they also needed help with their financial planning. And then if you look at the bottom, again, cognitive deficits. Now, this is the group that has the cognitive deficits. Improvement on the last slide was those who did not have the cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. So what we've come up with as a result of this is that there's a high prevalence of mobility problems for home health care patients. Actually, we couldn't even find any literature that said what the prevalence was, and what we found is it's 97% of patients who go to home care have problems with mobility. We found that mobility status at admission is a predictor of improvement, and that we found that variations for predictors existed within the subgroup. So if you're at a one, two, three, four, or five, what the predictors are of what's the likelihood of improving are different within those groups. So that sub-analysis of groups is really important. Think about precision medicine, and with precision medicine, I call it precision healthcare. Um, but when you think about that, that's what nurses have called tailoring for a long time. And so we may not have been using genomic data, but we've been using clinical data to do tailoring of our interventions to specific populations with specific characteristics. This kind of pulls out why we need evidence-based practice, but evidence-based practice always has to be tailored specifically to the characteristics of people we're seeing. One of the things that I found very interesting is one of the computer science students that I worked with had worked with me previously where we actually had intervention data as well as OASIS data, and he kept saying, well, where's the intervention data? And I'm like, well, we don't have it. And he's like, well, why don't you have it? And I'm like, because 
There's very few agencies that actually use standardized nursing terminology for interventions. He goes, well, that's really dumb. <laughs> and I'm like, I got it. <laughs> and so we, if we really want to be able to look at what interventions, besides, you know, like uh, they got home care, they didn't get home care, what interventions make a difference, we need to have the standardized terminology for interventions and not just for our assessments that we're doing as well as, you know, some of the outcomes that we're able to um, demonstrate through the use of OASIS. So with that, I'm going to stop and time for questions. questions. Yeah. Time for questions. One or two. Deal. So Bonnie, I'll ask you one. Okay. Um, so from the mobility study, so you focused on the group two that yep. had room to um, improve. So from that study, do you conclude for home care that interventions should be targeted toward people that are scoring a one or a two on the OASIS for mobility? Or can you not conclude that yet? Um, what we found is patients with a score of one, meaning that they just needed some help intermittently, mm -hmm. I'm not sure they're actually going to improve that much. You know, I, part of it is I think there's a ceiling effect that mm -hmm. exists in the data. Um, but for two, three, and four, I think that you really have to look at the tailoring of interventions and patients at different levels of disability and admission really will require different interventions and that the same interventions won't work for everybody the same all the time. And do you plan on bringing in some intervention data from those that do have coded data within your we actually have, we've actually done some of that in the past, but um, what we found when I first started at the U is we had data from 15 home care agencies that used the OMPA system as well as OASIS. Uh, but there aren't many places that are actually using the Omaha system and OASIS together. Hmm. Um, through software vendors, we're seeing a couple of vendors that do this, but not very many. Hmm. So getting that data is a challenge. Wow. wow. So now I'm working with hospital ambulatory data instead, trying to standardize the nursing data <laughs> retrospectively mm -hmm. so that we can uh, really look at patients across a continuum of care. Right. Thank you, that was terrific. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So next we'll have Dawn, who, you know, we've heard about how you set up the data to capture it from Sue and Bonnie about analytics. And now Dawn is going to tell us, <coughs> give us some more practical um, talk about, you know, what we want to do with this. So we really want to turn it into decision support. And Dawn has some really good pointers for doing that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a bit height challenged, so I'm sure probably most of you can only see the top of my head, and I haven't got a box to stand on, so I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so what I'm going to cover this afternoon is really some lessons I've learned along the way in my research journey in terms of looking at how nurses make decisions and how we design, evaluate, implement decision support systems. So I'm going to very quickly go over a framework for decision making, which is a very common framework we use to conceptualise decision making in nursing, and how we might use that as the basis for informing decision support interventions. Talk a little bit about what evidence you might use, where might it come from. I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough is who's going to use a decision support system and their characteristics, and how important that is in terms of both designing the system and then how people use it in practice. Some implications in terms of some work I've been doing looking at systems and environment and how that impacts on the use of decision support. And then really some pointers for discussion because I think I, I sometimes raise more questions than answers with some of this work. So for those of you in the room who might not know what a decision support system actually is, um, the ideal way of looking at decision support is a way of integrating information, and ideally that should be from high quality evidence-based studies, with the characteristics of individual patients to provide advice to clinicians to help with their decision making. I think the key issues there is it's individualised to the patient, and it provides advice and support. It doesn't stand in for decision making, it is another tool that we can use to support it along the way. 
And systems can be categorised in two ways. They can be passive, so the decision maker actually has to make quite a lot of effort to find that information in order to support their decision making. Or they can be very active systems, so they can actually um, provide guidance and advice at the point of decision making. And the most common example of that in our EHR systems at the moment is the alerts that we get when we're trying to do something. The system interferes, it alerts you to say, don't do that, do something else. Did you know there was a problem? That's an active type of decision support system. I just thought it would be quite helpful for you to, to really reflect on what we're trying to do when we're making decisions in practice. And this is a very simplified version of um, a very standard approach we use to conceptualising decision making in nursing. So what we're actually looking at is, um, based on the nursing process, we collect information, something called Q acquisition, we process that in some way to come up with a judgement, some sort of assessment of the patient condition. And on the basis of that assessment, we take a decision. Um, what are we going to do to intervene in terms of making it better? Um, and on the bottom, I, I know this isn't very clear, but this is a diagram from a study that I've just completed in England, looking at pain assessment in people with dementia, where at the beginning of the study, we conceptualise the process as we collect a lot of information about the patient's pain. We carry out a pain assessment, we might ask the patient, we might observe their behaviour, we might talk to colleagues in the multidisciplinary team and on the basis of that information collection we make an assessment about the patient's pain. Are they in pain? Are they not in pain? What level of pain is it? And on the basis of that assessment we would intervene. Do we need to give them some analgesics? Do we need to intervene in another way to relieve that pain? And in the process of that there's a feedback loop. There's an assumption that on, at some point we'll go back and reassess and carry that process out again. So that's a very basic um, overview of the decision process and then that can help inform the way that we design decision support systems. Where in the decision process are we trying to support the decision making? Is it in the information searching bit? Are we actually just trying to make it easy for people to collect the information together so that they can make their judgment? And a lot of pain assessment tools, that's what they're designed to do. They're not designed to support the rest of the decision process, they're designed to help you collect the information so that you can make a judgment about the severity of somebody's pain. Do we actually also want the decision support system to make a suggestion about what the appropriate assessment might be? If some of the early decision support systems in um, artificial intelligence, we're actually looking at diagnosis and can we actually suggest to the clinicians what the most likely diagnosis is given the system? And that's an example of that type of decision support. Do we actually want to design a decision support system that basically says, you've made a diagnosis and you've assessed this patient's in pain, these are the options you have in terms of interventions, these are the things that you could do. And a lot of medication decision support systems are those types of decision support systems. You know what the patient problem is, you know what their condition is. The decision support is suggesting what interventions based on the evidence might be most effective. Or are we trying to prevent events? Are we trying to make, prevent people to make mistakes in that decision process? Some decision support systems are trying to support all of those processes, some only bits of it. But we need to be clear about what the purpose is. Why are we designing it? Where is the problem in that, that, that framework? The next thing we need to look at is where does the evidence come from to support our decision process and how do we build that into the decision support system? Um, when I'm looking at designing systems, one of the first things I do is go and look at the evidence-based guidelines. What do they tell me? What should we be doing? And quite often, the reason why we've identified we need a decision support system is because we know that we should be doing X, we should be doing something in a, a, a particular way, and we have evidence from practice that people aren't doing it that way. So we have evidence-based guidance, we have the evidence-based randomized clinical control trials, we have systematic reviews, and people still aren't making the right decisions. So can we develop a decision support system that gives them the evidence that tells them what they should be doing. Sometimes, in nursing in particular, we don't have that high quality research evidence. So we base it on clinical expertise and guidance. 
Increasingly, this is where decisions are for and big data science and predictive analytics are coming together. We are doing the sort of work that Bonnie and Sue have been describing in terms of collecting huge amounts of data, developing predictive analytical models on the basis of that data. We then have to go, well, how do we then implement it into practice to help nurses make meaningful decisions? So it's the next stage. More often than not, depending on the decision support, it will be a mixture of evidence. Sometimes we have good research evidence for one part of the decision process, but not such good evidence for another part of the decision process. And we have to mix the two and say, how can we present this to clinicians in a way which makes sense to them? And I think the key here is to make sure that it's individualised to the patient, that we're using information which is meaningful for the patient group we're looking at. Um, and I'm not going to cover it in this um, talk, but I've done some very interesting work in the UK with nurses with decision support systems where the decision support system they're using has not actually been tailored to the patient group they're looking after. And then people wonder why they don't use the decision support system. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was um, the decision maker. Who's making the decisions? What are they doing? And one of the things, again, which isn't quite addressed in a lot of the literature is that nurses actually quite often are using decision support in a very different way to the way in which they're used by physicians. Um, and I, I, I did a systematic review of nurses' use of decision support quite a long while ago now. It was published in 2007 and we're just in the process of updating this. And what we found was that actually CDSS for nurses at that time were actually being used a lot for role substitution. So nurses with decision support were being compared to physicians without it to make sure that they could make the same decisions as physicians, but they're cheaper. And that, that's the UK context. That's where an awful lot of, of the literature on early decision support was supposed to be in focus. Um, they used to support nurses in advanced practice. Um, and again, there's a lot of decision support systems to support nurses with triage in particular. And used to support decisions about patient safety and there's an increasing number of decision support systems looking at things like pressure officers and fall rates and, and sepsis and improving decision support in those areas of practice where we identify that there are gaps. But that's very different to prescribing decision. It's very different to has somebody got the back has a vaccination recently. They're very different types of decisions and they need different types of decision support. The other issue to do with decision makers is their expertise. And I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on this slide where really what this is, is, is showing you is a, a condensed version of a huge amount of research that's been done on how we develop expertise and experience in all sorts of professions, not just nursing. Benner's expert to novice being probably the most well-known study in nursing. And effectively what this is showing is that the way in which we make decisions changes as we develop expertise. So when you are a novice, you are more likely to need and use rule bulk based, protocol based approaches to decision making because you have no experience by which to base your decisions. As you get more experienced, you rely less on those decision rules and more on your own experience, your intuition, fast automatic cognitive processing. Okay. Now that has an implication when we're talking about decision support, particularly given that I've just said most of the decision support systems in nursing have been developed for advanced nurses, experienced nurses, to help them make decisions in an area of practice that maybe it's, it's pushing the boundaries of their role. They're rule-based systems. Expert nurses do not make decisions by the basis of protocols and rules. They use intuition, heuristics, experience. So when you're designing a decision support system, if you're designing a decision support system for use by experts and you try to get them to follow the rules, you get a mismatch. And what you end up with is something that we found in a the, the study where we were looking at how nurses use decision support systems in practice, where the expert nurses were using the decision support systems not as guidance to make their decisions in practice, but to confirm the decision they'd already made. Yeah. 
because they'd already met, they had the experience, they used their intuition, they made the decision, and then they used the decision support system to tell them they'd made the right decision. Okay. And then if the decision support system didn't tell them they'd made the right decision, they more often would not ignored it anyway. Or they would manipulate the system because they knew what the right answer was. So they would manipulate the protocols in the system so that the system came up with the answer that they knew was the right answer. Yeah. Um, and we've seen this in a lot of research to do with decision support. As people get more experience with the system, they're less likely to follow the guidance. And my argument is, is that's probably because the decision support has actually been designed for the wrong type of decision maker. Okay, you need to be really thinking, what is the purpose of what we're doing? Is it to try and help novice decision makers make safe decisions, in which case rule-based systems are fine? Or is it to try and prevent expert decision makers from making silly, silly lipses and mistakes and errors, which is a different type of decision support? And now I'm going to move on to the last bit of my talk, which is about the system and the environment. And um, coming from a different healthcare system, I've only been here a couple of years, this is actually a very important aspect of designing decision support, which again is increasingly being acknowledged but has been overlooked. The environment, where we take the decisions, who's taking them, really impacts on the way in which you design decision support. I come from a system where in most hospitals we still do not have electronic health record systems. I come from an environment where if we wanted to design decision support it had to be paper based because we didn't have the electronic tools to support it. That means the way in which you design the system is very different to if you have a very, very high tech environment where you have lots of different feeds of data automatically being collected. What you do is very different, and how people work and the workflows and how they integrate it into their work um, is, is, is also there. And I just thought I'd finish just highlighting the importance of understanding the context and environment. Going back to my study on pain assessment in patients with dementia in acute hospital settings, after a year of doing an ethnographic study, collecting data in four hospitals, 11 wards across the UK, looking at how pain assessment and management is actually carried out, not how we think it is based on our lovely decision model at the beginning. What we found is something more akin to this. The organisational context of the wards and the hospitals where we were doing the observation actually affected how those pain assessment and management decisions were taken. If you were a patient with dementia on a surgical ward, you were much more likely to even it, we were much more likely to find that nurses acknowledged that pain might be a reason for their behaviour. If they were on a medical ward, pain might not even have been something that they would identified as being an issue. Who takes the decisions? A nurse might um, give the medication, but in the NHS, as it currently stands, it would be a healthcare assistant who would have done the assessment. It might be the doctor that prescribed the medication, and it was almost certainly somebody else in the healthcare team who looked to do the reassessment to see if it had been effective. So the decisions were complex, they were carried out over people, and they were carried out over time, and they varied according to the unit. So that then has implications for how we design decision support to support that process, because we can't locate it with the assumption that it's going to be one individual clinician doing the whole process. It's one person assessing, one person identifying the pain, another person giving medication, another person looking and reassessing. So we have to be able to communicate over time, and we also have to get lots of information from different sources to be able to do it effectively. So really, at the end of my talk, the sorts of things that I, I sort of thought were good points of discussion is how do we provide real-time decision support for nursing in a clinical environment which is increasingly complex, where we have complex patients and actually the actual process we're trying to support, particularly with nurses who work collaboratively and coordinate across um, clinicians, how, how do we support that decision process effectively? And does it need to be used by everybody? Do we actually just target it at the people really need to support their decisions, so the novice decision makers. 
to be really, or do we actually want to say, you experts, you have to use this because you're more likely to make a mistake in this particular area of decision making that everybody else has not have for? Or do we have to make everybody use the same decision support system? And how do you effectively integrate it into these very complex organisational environments? Um, and, and I think we have a lot of work to go. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was so concerned about the time, but I didn't have got any questions. <laughs> John, could you just talk a minute about um, how you, what any strategies for getting, gaining buy-in when you install uh, decision support? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not rocket science. You talk to the nurses. <laughs> and you'll be amazed. In one of the studies that we did in England, we actually had triage nurses who were working in GP practices, general practice, um, who have been given a decision support tool to use, which have been designed for our telephone and triage service. So it was designed for telephone and triage, but they weren't being expected to use it face to face. And they were basically told they had to use it, they had no choice. So it was not designed for the decisions they were taking. They had no choice and no influence over it. And then um, the, the healthcare commissioners who told them that they had to use it were very surprised when they really weren't using it. Um, and I think that's the, that happens a lot, yeah. is that most of it, it's a, it, you need to it's imposed on them. Imposed yeah. rather yeah. than being designed for them. One more question. Go ahead. With nurses, because their work is so different, and they're not often in the start prescribing, and therefore the reverse, having it pop up from the system is not always optimal. Did any of your research look at what are best methods in delivering that over? Um, not really, because as I said, most of my research has been done in the UK up to this point, so we're not as far advanced as some of the electronic systems that you have, so the issue of alerts isn't quite so much of an issue as it, as it is here. Um, my, the only reflection is, again, the triage nurses, they would just overwrite, they would just ignore them, and, and because they, they could predict the way the system operated and the algorithms in the system, they sort of manipulated their way around it. So they'd say things like, well, if I put this in here, it's going to alert me, so I'm going to do something else so it doesn't. Oh, yeah. wow. They're, they're very, you know, as you do. All right, thank you all very much. Thank Terrific you. panel. Thank you. Thank you.